Hello and welcome back to Reptiles and Research. Now recently I gave a public talk on ball pythons and it's brewing up a bit of conversation. Now Mutations Creations Canada covered it which I think is excellent because it's brewing up conversation and this conversation needs to be had. So let's see what the criticisms are and let me try my best to provide context. I, I just saw it and I was just like, what the hell? And they gave all these, uh, and I'm reading the comments. If you go to uh, World of All Pythons and check the comments, so many people are like, look at all your studies and, you know, all the things that are for, for other animals, not even ball pythons. Um, it, it, it's just ridiculous. So Billy discovered my excerpt of the full talk that I posted in World of Ball Pythons. Now I've seen this point being made a lot, so let me provide some clarification here. The video in that group posted was an excerpt of the full talk. My logic being is that my full talk was nearly 30 minutes long, including the questions. So what I did is I snipped out little bits that I made like minute long videos that were part one, part two, and they would feed the people across down into the full talk. Now the people that would initially see the thumbnail and see the timestamp of being nearly half an hour would have been put off. But because I've got them to watch a little one minute video and they've gone, oh, that was really interesting. I've hooked them and they would watch the full talk that I wouldn't have watched otherwise. That was my logic in the planning to do that. Now in the full talk, I prefaced before getting the ball pythons that neuroplasticity is how the brain works. So what I did was I started talking about how neuroplasticity has been observed in bees and then I went into sea slugs and in fish and in mammals and I went to a rattlesnake. What I did was start off at things that are really, really minuscule like bees and sea slugs and I worked my way closer to ball pythons. The point I was making is that it's well conserved across species that are vertebrates as well as invertebrates and python regis as in the bull python is no exception to the rule and that's why I got like you wouldn't think it would be in a bee you wouldn't think it would be in a sea slug and I got closer and closer to royal pythons and then we start going into royal python studies that was what was in the full talk and that was what had the full context the bull pythons aren't some magic exception to the rule that's how the brain works they aren't a special species that doesn't have neuroplasticity or learning they're the same as everything else. They're capable of learning. So when you write scientifically, basically you cite after you make a statement with studies showing what you've just said. So when I said it's been observed in mammals, I cited multiple studies about mammals showing that it occurred in mammals. So when people looked at the reference list without context and they were saying things like, this doesn't prove anything, you're looking at elephant studies and things like that, that's because I said mammals plural and I cited multiple mammal studies showing it in mammals. I cited everything to show that I was proving what I was saying was actually in the scientific literature. Yes, it was in sea slugs. Yes, it was in bees. And yes, it was in mammals. And one of those citations for mammals was elephants. I'm not saying the ball python has the brain of an elephant. I'm saying that neuroplasticity is there and present across the board. That's what I'm saying. So when people were making comments like, oh, you can't say this, this is a study about elephants. Yes, it was quite funny and it was quite humorous. And also quite frustrating because it's a mute point because it comes from a place of a lack of understanding. And maybe that is my fault because I pulled out ex excerpts which meant it didn't have the full context. But again, I was hoping that they would go through the funnel to the main talk. And clearly they didn't. Clearly they stopped at that one video and then commented. And because we keep them in racks for so many years, when we sell them to people who put them in large glass enclosures with, um, you know, enrichment things and, and lights and all the other stuff, because we've deprived them and their brain, when we put them and sell them and put people put them in their, in their tanks, they're lost because they don't know, their brain can't realize that there's a light and what the light is because we've never given them the light. You get lights when you open or, it up. Or there's a branch. <laughs> it doesn't know to climb because it's never had the opportunity to climb in, on a branch. So That's the stupidest thing ever. The, the reason why when we give these animals to, to people – who put them in big enclosures, they don't do well, is because we fuck them up in the racks. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's basically what I'm I getting from I wonder where it. this guy went to school. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, a failed what? education system so, there. So, so. Yes, neuroplasticity goes both ways, not only forward. We know that bull pythons work this way because they learn through operant conditioning, just like everything else. So I'll give you a definition of operant conditioning, just so we're all on the same page. So... 
Through operant conditioning, an association is made between a behaviour and a consequence, whether that is negative or positive for that behaviour. Now this has been observed by vivarium keepers of royals and rat keepers of royals alike. Hook training is a perfect example of this. When you introduce the touch of the hook, an association is made with that and then a consequence, i.e. oh I'm not being fed or I'm about to be picked up. That is a perfect example. They've learned an association with that stimulus and then a result, a consequence because of that. That is a perfect example of operant conditioning and neuroplasticity facilitating that operant conditioning. They are learning through open conditioning and neuroplasticity. And then people have gone even further with station training and target training. It's very, very clear that they can learn through open conditioning. And you know this. You know this yourself, that hook training is a thing. So you know that they learn through open conditioning, even if you may not understand the underlying mechanics of the process, which I went into in this talk. Their brains learn in the same way as everything else. They learn through the same mechanics of neurons firing and building new neural pathways. And those pathways that have just been built through learning because they can learn, also are capable of atrophying when not used or if they're not even built in the first place. And it is illogical to state otherwise. <laughs> in terms of where I went to school, I went to University Centre Smarshall and I got my degree in Applied Animal Sciences. My co-host Ellie Hills also got the same degree and then she went on to do a Masters in Zoo Biology. My other colleague Laurie Torini has got a degree in zookeeping from the University of Washington and she's a qualified animal trainer. So perhaps we should forego our failed education systems and instead apply for the degree that you obtained. Because we raise these animals okay and give it proper humidity proper temps um you know we feed it on, 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 on and and give it proper nutrition and meals and, and fresh water um and, and we, we 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 clean it and good husbandry and, and stuff like that because we're depriving it of light and 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 movement and and being able to you know make its own you know cognical i forget the, the name the uh, the big fancy word we're not making it let decisions of, of its own so when when we sell it and someone puts it in a bigger aquarium we're we fucked it up all those basic requirements are not going to be working the animal's brain and building higher cognition they're just the basic requirements of care it's the lack of complexity and learning stimulus that is the variable um and, and one person said it's like yeah but you know what's funny is is you know all the people that have them in these big tanks with heat and screen tops and, and all the, you know, the stuff and, and, and freaking it out. Like, why is your ball python smashing his face off the glass? Um, why is it, you know, there's no glass always, in the wild. Yeah, but 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 yeah. the thing is, is why is it striking all the time? Because you know, ours are hardly striking. We we went to a, a, an expo yesterday. We bought several hundred animals, and and people were sitting there going like, "Wow, man! Like they're so tame. They're not even trying to." Pack the deli, you know, we took some out, you know, people hand sanitize and there's a few that we let, you know, people handle and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe they're not like striking or anything. They're, they're calm. Yeah. But then, you know, I don't know how many people I've had that, that, you know, has had a pet and called this like, how, how do I get it from being so, so angry or, you know, it, 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 it's uh, always attacking because it stressed the fuck out. I mean, like, that's, that's my Synopsis. Yes, this was also covered in my full talk. When you raise an animal in a deprived state and then you hard transition that animal to an open and exposed scenario with lots of stimulus, it stresses. In my full talk, I also talked about how inappropriately set up vivariums can also exasperate the issue further. Everything you're saying has been addressed in my full talk, so I'd, I really recommend watching it. The majority of people that do that are calling, saying, why isn't it eating? Why is it shedding? You know, why is it shedding improperly, or it's it's stuck shed? How come I can't keep the temps and, and the humidity up, and and you know stuff like that? Um, uh, you know, I just I honestly thought it was just because big enclosure, freaking the little snake out that lives underground and it's nocturnal, all these lights beaming down. And you know to get heat and so that they can come and and and, and bask because it's it's they they want to bask that, that's new to me. Um, so they want to explore, the they, but they want to explore, right? I, I I don't know how many ball pythons in the wild are fucking exploring. Like what are they exploring for? They're exploring <laughs> for food because they have to in order to survive. 
You know what I mean? You didn't watch Dave Coffin's video. Correct. But someone put that on there. Hey, watch this, right? So why do people call up and say, I can't control my humidity and temperatures? Well, because they can't control the humidity and temperatures in whatever scenario they're in. Perhaps advise not to keep in glass, but instead keep in a vivarium that will maintain heat and humidity. You know, advise them on a PVC enclosure or advise them what they can do to fix the current scenario. Please don't take a discussion about deprived and then complex and then make it about inappropriate enclosure materials. Again, I'd like to say that I covered inappropriately set up vivariums in my full talk. You know, rather than tell customers to keep their royal in a rack, we advise them on how to appropriately set up a vivarium. Educating is a part of selling animals. I've literally sold a hatchling royal into a 4x2x2 and stood there and spoke with them for hours about how to set it up and how to set them up to succeed. I was literally there like, put this piece of cork here, this here, this here, put this long piece across the back, that means the entire thermal gradient is an option for a hide. It doesn't need to be exposed to travel between the two, blah, 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 blah. I walked them through how to make it work and it worked fantastically. They come in every week and buy frozen and tell me how well their animal is doing. Why? Because I gave them the education they needed to set them up for success. I taught them how to manipulate temperatures and humidity in an appropriately set up vivarium. It's not hard. The kids that come in and buy the first raw python do get it right if you set them up for success with the right education. If someone's gonna put a raw python in a glass tank with a full screen top and their room isn't already warm enough or isn't sat at 70% humidity, then maybe don't sell them the animal and then consult them on the right setup and then ask for proof of setup. This is basic pet shop 101. And this is the same reasons why I won't sell a raw python into an exoterra. You know, that's common sense. They also don't exclusively live underground. Do they spend lots of time inactive and hiding? Yes. Did they also come out and express other behaviours and bask and whatnot? Yes. And if you look at the paper that I covered in my talk that compared raw pythons in vivs and then in racks, they basked for two and a half hours a day. And also, might I add, significantly less when the UV wasn't present. So they weren't just basking for warmth. The UV was a part of what was making them bask for longer. They were seeking the UV. So when they compared what they did in each scenario, when they went into the vivarium, they spent... 63.91% of the time resting, yawning, or drinking, which is all the scenarios that can occur in a rack, right? So 36.9% of the time they spent expressing behaviors other than this. That means they were spending 8.6 hours a day in a given 24 hour period expressing whatever behavior they wanted to outside of the ones I just told you about. They even spent 1.6 hours of a day climbing. So I would like to ask you, how would you propose that a unstimulating rack with nothing but a water bowl facilitates the 8.6 hours of a day they express doing different behaviours that they can't do in a rack? It can't. And the study I included in my talk will show you as such. Yes, I did watch the Dave Coffin video. I even made a video analysing his video. He found four snakes in total, two of which were outside. One of which was basking and the other was on the move. I'm so glad you found Dave Kaufman's video so credible because if a sample size of four snakes and then opinions given based upon no tangible scientific data is lauded as really credible and held to a really high regard by yourself, then surely a study that had 36 animals that had filmed them 24 7 had statistical analysis and then was peer-reviewed before it was published well surely that should be the pinnacle right if four snakes is good enough surely 35 is good enough and stat analysis and film 24 7 and then peer-reviewed before it got published surely it should be amazing right now i'm going to presume that you wouldn't propose the opposite because that would be highly illogical and i think you're both intelligent blokes now there are a few more things said in this video that generally kind of repeat the opinions expressed before it was just kind of like ranting and like getting it off his chest i feel but i will link to the full thing in the pinned comments so no one can accuse me of leaving things out and you can get the full context. I would like to say thank you very much for highlighting my talk. I appreciate that. I think if you go and watch the full talk, it'll give you a lot of context to the things that you're asking. If you still have more to dispute, then I welcome you onto our podcast. I think you seem like a nice bloke and we'd have a really interesting conversation. And you can grill me all you want and I'll provide context to what you're asking and then we'll get further clarification from that. I'll walk you through it hand by hand and you'll get a full understanding one on one. I don't mind being criticised. I don't mind being grilled. I welcome you to come to me and grill me for an hour straight. I welcome it. But thank you for highlighting my talk. I really appreciate that.